Uh, my name is Alyssa Lines, and I'm sitting here like this because I want this to be a fireside kind of conversation. We had promoted this initially as our dedication of the TDY. And someone called me and said, how are you going to dedicate a plane that is not going to be here? And we've been working with the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola for the last couple of months um, to move a wonderful PDY that's being loaned to us by that um, by Naval History and Heritage to be able to display at our museum. And it turns out when we went to look at the play that uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Cash Barber was a volunteer at that museum working on our play. And so when we invited him to come, we thought the plane would be here as well. So we're a little delayed in getting the plane here, but we didn't want to miss an opportunity of sharing um, Cash's story uh, with you. And what could be better than to have Admiral Kozad with us as well, who is running the Pensacola, uh, the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation. So this is just the best of both worlds. So I don't want to take a lot of time, but I wanted to just share, you know, I, I collect quotes and for those who attend our museum program, as you know, that that's just been very important to me because it's a way for us to remember why the past is so powerful and how we use the past to inspire and to um, prepare our next generation of leaders. So President Roosevelt said, those who have long enjoyed such privileges as we enjoy today, forget in time that men have died to win them. And I think that's an important part of the programming and the educational experiences that we provide to our young people. It's so easy to take things for granted because this is the way we have always lived, but it's not the way um, the world has always lived. And it's not what our parents and grandparents were feeling when the threat of World War II came our way. So today's discussion, uh, we're saying, is a fireside chat. I'm going to turn it over to um, Rod Bankston, who is our Director of Exhibits, Restoration, and Curatorial Services. So the PDY will come into his charge. And all the exhibits that you see here and all the stories that we share um, are put together by Rod and his team. And I'll leave you with one other quote from Harry Truman. Our debt to the heroic men and valiant women and the service of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifices. And we had the Rosie the Riveters there with us last night. It was a very, it was a very powerful evening, and we're just so excited that you're here and that you've shared your story with our members, um, and we're excited to share your book um, and those stories as we move on. So over to you, Rod. Do you need the microphone? I'm good. And just have to switch. Please note that he is wearing a jacket that says Pearl, that says Pacific Aviation Museum. He was a founder when this museum opened in 2006. So we've been, we've been commenting on our, our um, heritage and our legacy. And it's great to see that that legacy started years ago uh, for cash. Thank you. Thank you, Listen. We're in Go ahead. I'm going to introduce uh, now Rear Admiral Kozad, um, and he will have some remarks on um, history of PBY and significance, and also um, introduce Cash. Then we're going to uh, kind of sit down as she, um, as Alyssa indicated, a sort of a fireside chat up front here, and I've invited uh, Cash to tell some stories. Um, the images in the back will sort of follow his uh, storyline, and um, I will uh, tell you a few things more about Cash in a moment. It is my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce Rear Admiral Kyle Kozad. Rear Admiral Kozad graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1985 with a Bachelor of Science in Oceanography and Physics. He earned a Master of Science in National Resource Management from the National Defense University's Eisenhower School. He also attended the Navy Corporate Business Course at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. He has conducted operational tours at all four maritime patrol and reconnaissance aircraft sites. He has served as an instructor pilot in multiple operational tours, including two tours with the VP-30 the P-3 Fleet Replacement Squadron, and one with the Canadian 
Air Force's 404 Squadron in Greenwood, Nova Scotia, as a CP-140 exchange instructor pilot. His shore tours included Navy Personnel Command as Aviation Commander and Captain Detailer, Commanding Officer, Staff Enlisted Personnel, and Executive Assistant to the Commander. He served as the 22nd Senior Director of the White House Situation Room and as Chief of Naval Operations Fellow at the CNO's Strategic Studies Group. Rear Admiral Kyle Kozen. Thank you. Cash, I don't know if it was just me, but uh, I almost fell asleep just listening to that. How about you? <laughs> hey, good afternoon. I, I, I promise uh, I, I'm not going to talk very long. I've got a flight to catch at the airport. So um, I told Cash that uh, after I gave my opening remarks, once I had left, he could tell everybody that uh, I wasn't as smart as my biography sounded, and he can correct the record for my misstatements. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and it's a pleasure uh, to continue our relationship at the National Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola with this fine museum, and we're excited uh, about the uh, Catalina that will be here soon. Um, Alyssa, uh, I'd be lying to you if I said um, I'm not completely heartbroken that the airplane's not here yet, because if it were, you wouldn't invite me back. And so maybe this is a way to come out next year or the following year, uh, but we're excited about that. Um, you know, everybody is familiar that World War II really changed the way that the United States Navy fights. Uh, with the advent of the uh, aircraft carrier, with aircraft uh, that flew off the carrier deck like the Dauntless, the Devastator, the Wildcat. But, you know, today I'd just like to give you a brief glimpse of the importance uh, of that large amphibian uh, that we call the PBY Catalina. Um, and it's got some history. It's got a lot of history. That history really traces back to Fort Island and Kaneohe. On December 7th of 1941, uh, as the Japanese came in, um, I haven't read this in too many places, but I think they had a couple strategic uh, objectives. Number one was to destroy as many ships as they could, but also to destroy as many Catalinas as they could. And that fateful warning, 51 of 60 of the Catalinas that were signed to both Fort Island here uh, and to Kaneohe were destroyed and put out of service. Uh, and that's significant because that capability was the Navy's long-range surveillance capability. They did search and rescue and they did that surveillance. The good news was that story didn't stop on December 7th, 1941. Uh, the Navy went on to build a robust fleet of Catalinas uh, that would become probably one of the most uh, decorated aircraft during World War II, despite what you don't know about them. Um, I, I'm going to tell you a, a bit of a story. And, and again, uh, the Catalina was designed to do search and uh, rescue, was de designed to do surveillance, and eventually uh, long-distance anti-submarine warfare to find enemy submarines. Uh, but I think one of the most unique stories, and this is kind of where Cash and I tie into each other. Um, Cash was a member of VP-11, and VP-11 was one of several what they called Black Cat squadrons. So one of the very first squadrons that had a very rudimentary radar, uh, and to take advantage of that radar, they would paint those aircraft uh, kind of a dark gray black. They would fly at night where, where they were you know, virtually um, invisible to the Japanese, and they were very successful at crippling Japanese supply lines you know, making those raids. Um, but I'm sure Cash is going to tell you another story down in the South Pacific uh, about some herring rescues that they did uh, because uh, VP-11 had an amazing career. Uh, and I've had the fortune of meeting not only Cash, but one of his squadron mates, a gentleman named Lou Conter. Um, both these gentlemen are members of the Maritime Patrol Aviation Hall of Honor. So, Cash, uh, thanks for your service. Right. So it's, it's only fitting that we have a Catalina in your museum, and it, it represents you know, some of those deep traditions uh, in that rich service that the Catalina provided. Um, the gentleman to my right uh, enlisted in the Navy at the age of 17, uh, ended up uh, as a Catalina flight engineer uh, and crew chief years later, uh, and did uh, many, many years of service. As a matter of fact, uh, another shared service. Uh, Cash was the boss of a gentleman who works for me, his father. So our lines cross back and forth. But uh, um, Cash is about as aggressive uh, with over 3,000 hours flying the PBY Catalina, uh, doing some really incredible missions. And so it's uh, always an honor to share the stage with him. Uh, and uh, Cash, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, sir. 
crazy. Well, it's certainly a blessing and an honor to be here with you today. Uh, it's been a long struggle. I'm getting older every day and slower every day, so just be patient with me. I don't know. I have both children here. The good part that I went into the F-21, I didn't want to get drafted because the draft had already started. So I had the opportunity to volunteer and the folks to sign for me. Uh, so the way I went, Navy was the way to go because I knew that aviation in the Navy at time frame was wide open. So I was fortunate enough to get picked out of boot camp to go to the aviation machines from main school in Alameda. There's 30 of us in that group. When we graduated, graduated uh, a week after Thanksgiving, all 30 of us received orders for Pearl Harbor. Well, they put us on a cargo ship on the 6th of December to take us out to Pearl Harbor. Well, of course, we were seeing when the blitz started on December the 7th. So our skipper of the cargo ship was on uh, I think he decided he didn't want to go into combat without uh, deck guns on the ship we saw. So he turned around and went back to Merrill Island and, and just out of San Francisco, shifted to another cargo ship that had deck guns on. And of course, we picked up all kinds of supplies. Can you hear me out there, okay? And we sailed again on the 10th of December. Well, it took eight days across to Pearl Harbor. And we pulled into that Pearl Harbor mess on the 18th day of December. You can imagine the heartbreak, seeing all that destruction. And uh, the 30 of us were assigned to three brand new PBY squadrons over Caniole and every station. They had BP-11, 12, and 14 over there. So they put 10 of us in each one of those squadrons. And this was all done alphabetically. First 10, BP-11, next 10, BP-12, and so on. Well, that was great, but we didn't have any aircraft. So the local people was very concerned about commando landed on the beaches where it took you to Kenny away. So to beef up their defense force around the base, since we didn't have any planes, they gave you each one of us a rifle and put us in a foxhole for security. We were supposed to take care of I'm trying to keep right from you, but we were supposed to take care of these commandos that were going to hit the beach. Thank God they never showed up. And about six weeks later, we got our first replacement car, uh, PPY. They were stealing them from all over, a lot of them from the East Coast, because they couldn't build them fast enough to give us a squadron quota of them. Anyhow, we got our first plan about 15th of April. And alphabetically again, they pulled the first three ABCs out of the P-11 and signed us to flight crews at that point. And of course, we started on-the-job training. It was, it was about a fourth engineer at that time. So we had work our way up to be the original flight engineer of the PBY. And that didn't take long that we had some planes to start training on the job. And of course, um, you know what happened uh, with picking up a uh, blitz that was headed for Burlar. No, I did it for Midwood. And uh, all the PBYs at Pearl Harbor was involved in that. So from Kaneohe, we ferried torpedoes to Midway. We had a brand new torpedo squadron there, and uh, the only air space or a job to get more torpedoes over there. 
And uh, that was our, my involvement with the uh, Midway. But since you know how that turned out, thank God, uh, we got to get on the fancy for a change. And uh, our squatters, the GP-11 was the first squadron picked to, to go from Midway to Guadalcanal. The Marines had just landed there, and they need a lot of help. Well, believe me, if, when you get to beat me right here and see how big, slow, and, and uh, available, for, we couldn't have run anything. We cruised around about 90 knots. We had a range of 2,500 miles. So you can imagine the, that's the reason all our flights are 14 or 15 hours. Time we covered at 25, uh, 2,500 miles for a cherry. Uh, I know I was trying to think of where we're heading to there. Anyhow, I'm in the, in the, PBY program. Uh, our operation was about 50 50. They had seaplane tenders that would take care of us at, at the vast bases. And, uh, and the other 50% was by the CBs. Uh, uh, Every time I go to a bigger island, the CBs. With all their magic, would have us. Ten cities set on force to start operating from an island. Uh. So as we move forward, every time we get a bigger island, the CBs are the first ones there to, to build us the next ten city base again. So our operations are about 50% from the uh, carrier or tender. And the other fifty percent was um, blessed by the sea beast to make it up in ten city four. And they always make a ramp where we get the planes out of water there. But when when we started up at a buoy and the seaplane tender was taken care of we had a fuel barge and come out for a fuel with and the orders or came out to replace our ordnance. And then we had a maintenance board if we needed to operate from the buoy. I finished from that point. Uh, finally, we had a tough time at Guadalcanal, believe me. We were a big, slow, and vulnerable. And uh, we finally got relieved after losing several crews and went back to San Diego in the squadron Great Four. Uh, we got 12 brand new PBYs, and we'd just gotten home in January. And of course, we uh, forming the new squadron uh, three months later in the first week in April. Our squadron was designated to go back to the South Pacific. In that turn of events, we went from Catioli to, to the Philippines. To, Australia. That's where they paint their planes black, and we start our operating into the Indian Ocean. They had several advanced bases up the coast of uh, Australia, and uh, we had, we flew about every other day, and go to. One of the advanced bases drove and I patrol out of there and go to another advanced base. We kept going further north, getting closer to the New Guinea big area up there. New Guinea, New Guinea was to, we need to change my ground right in front. Can make a foray in front so they can hear you. Good news. I couldn't get the kind of owners and bogus who go underwater. You want to tell a black cat story for us? Okay, one well, of the best things about BPY was there. Uh, 
the haptic gaming. At my age, I can't pick some of this stuff up that fast. Just be patient. We had these, we had these Dumbo flights. Uh, the enemy had a lot of islands just out of the area where we were operating from. So every time they would get bombed by our courier task force or the Air Force planes, there'd be a couple PDYs out in the perimeter. And every time a pilot said, I've been hit, I'm going down, we went down with him and picked him right up. So the fact that we saved many uh, crews, one pilot or two or three people, and a lot of times rafts have been out in the ocean for several days, would drift into some of the little islands out there. And the natives was very much on our side of the defense and then running with it. They could make contact with us, say your crews here that are ready to be picked up. PBY would go to that island. It couldn't go in too close because of a coral reef. Every one of those small islands out there grew out of a coral section. You taxi over a coral and just tear up the bottom of that beautiful sea pun. So we had to stay out far enough, and the natives would bring those uh, crew members out to us. And, you know, then we could pick them up. I also ran several uh, field hospitals out in the Pacific area. And if any of these that were rescuing needed maintenance, and then the medical retention uh, would take up to the field hospital and drop them off. So that they get the service real, real soon and a better chance of surviving. But the Dumbo was very important in that response. And we shared that responsibility with our unit, with our submarines. If you remember, <clears throat> President George Bush, when he was shot down, was picked up by a submarine. We rotated that duty uh, with our sons. Uh, otherwise, he had been picked up by uh, Colonel either. So that was a beauty in the, that was a Dumbo operation. Cash, um, there's an interesting story of uh, New Guinea in December of 1843 when you participated in a, a rescue of commandos. Um, they say, very interesting story. Are you ready for that one? Okay. Bang, bang, bang. Our squad was, just, I guess you could say, fortunate to get to the job be going to New, uh, upper New Guinea. New Guinea was a that big island that the Japanese did not want to loom. That was a stepping stone to northern Australia. So the Allies secured the southern half of New Guinea, but the Australian commandos were still fighting them in the northern half. So when they needed supplies, we dropped supplies to them. Finally, they were getting in a situation where they wanted to be relocated. Our squadron got the mission to go in there and get them out. Other than that, the Two hundred and thirty-one of them, and we made nineteen individual trips in there to get around. But you gotta remember, the wingspan on the PPY at that time was a hundred and four feet. We had to land on the Seabeek River, which was two hundred feet wide. There wasn't much of a margin there. But once we got landing on the river. We run the nose of the PBY right into the muddy river bank and then started loading these commandos. And these 19 trips were individual trips up there. Each plane went in with a skeleton crew of only five people and no orchids. 
we had to go in the light because we knew it was bringing a big load down. So once we got there, each plane took out 25 commandos and some of their equipment. So we had a crew of five, so there's 30 people aboard each one of these planes. Uh, we had first thought we had, we may have a problem getting off a of muddy river bank, but it turned out to be quite a snap. All the pilots had to do was jockey the throttles a couple times, and we waddled right off of that muddy bank into the middle of the river. Then our pre flight, then our only concern at that time was debris coming down the river as we were going up to take off. Thank God that, God that never happened, so we safely made the 19 individual trips up there over a five day period to get all 230 cent people out of there. Says it's turned out such a good rescue operation. Uh, BP 11 got to present the unit citation for that operation. It went off smoother than you could imagine. Uh, what we were facing when we started. Uh, no accidents, nobody was hurt. Uh, just kind of a clean sweep. So it, it made you feel real good at least. The old PPY was ready to help do that, get in there and get us out. Uh, but what a great operation that turned out to be. That was in December 1943. Uh, we pulled that off. Cash, um, I was visiting with you last March and had the privilege of uh, uh, seeing you give a tour in front of the PBY cutaway. Um, we have an image of that. And uh, you mentioned uh, to this group in particular, I know you tell the stories differently sometimes, you know, different stories, that is. And uh, it struck me that it was fascinating. I had not realized that, you know, the black cats were flying in pitch black at night and that whole concept. And what, what was that like, especially in your position as, uh, as that engineer up under the wing? Well, that was a blessing. That was the best thing could have happened. In our regards, we take off at sunset, come back sunrise. And with the radio radar we had, we can pick up a ship 50, 60 miles away, haul men on it, and we could see their beautiful wake in the water. They couldn't see us. So our first job was send in a contact report. Well, we had to identify the ship as be a time or two that it being not, not being the daylight to make out just what kind of a ship we had picked up. So in a case like that, we'd have to drop a million can to power parachute flare, which would light up the area between us and the wake in the water and uh, watch the, well, before we could get to the end of the identification completed in some, they would already get shot down the parachute flare. That's one of the mistakes I wondered about. Well, I'll tell you a black cat story here. It started with us one night. Of course, we didn't see them, they couldn't see us. But, uh, it wasn't light enough to make an identification of the ship. So, uh, by the way, with my family out there right now, uh, I've never told you this story. And I didn't put it in my book. It turned out uh, we were in for a, a special battle. They were going to shoot down there first my cat. And uh, so this is kind of a set up for the next baby why they came in. Well, we, fly, we after they shot her flare around, we had enough time to identify what it was. Turned out to be a heavy cruiser, and they were prepared for the black cat at night. 
uh, once we got our report out over the air, uh, we always just told her dive on a gliding bomb attack for, for the wake in the water. Well, I was embarrassed that pilot put the nose down to go in for our night bombing. The pan tail of that cruiser opened up with the paragers, artillery shells, you can imagine. It was so loud it hurt my ears. And the force of the big guns slowed us down and moved us around. Thank God they didn't realize the altitude we were. And every bit of the orbits they fired went underneath us. There's tree, they had tracer bullets all over the area, all under our, our altitude. We were blessed because they screwed up, but we've always tried to figure out why they thought we were that low. Otherwise, if they had raised the elevation of the, of the guns five feet, and they had blasted us out of the sky. So we still blessed from where they goofed, uh, and uh, operations as well as our crew tried to determine why they thought we were down that low of altitude when we had just started. The altitude we went in, it depended on the tight ship we were global humming. If it was a big troop transport or cargo vessel, uh, we wouldn't go in so far, but what, going in a little higher uh, because of the super steps. And keep abstraction from the dropping the bomb. Uh, we got credit, the PBY got credit for seeking over 100,000 tons of enemy shipping all at night, and we never lost an aircraft. So you can imagine uh, fighting a war where you can see them and they can't see you. What a difference that made in our operations. Uh, it, is, it is time to change from that daytime routine because we, we were handicapped in that regard. Just too slow, just too bonnable. So, flying black cat operations, which we did then, all the way from Pearl Harbor to, to the Philippines is where we wound up. It took three, three years for us to go from Pearl Harbor to the Lady Gulf from the Philippines. A lot of island hopping on the Celtic. Uh, but our operation changed usually from a support tender or back to the CBs that set up an island for it. But we just kept moving forward. Every time a bigger island would come up, uh, CBs, you can't imagine that. I think I could keep building in city overnight and be able to pull the plane out of the water and do anything we had to do that way. Because we didn't always have a seaplane tender around to take care of us. So that was a story in the rescue. Uh, another great story I don't ask to tell you about. This turned out to be a mission of fate and courage. And believe me, folks, before, before we finish this mission, we need a lot of faith and we need a lot of courage. And We were, had three flights every night flying into the Philippines. Well, on September the 15th, 1944, one of our crews didn't return the next morning. Well, our skipper at that time was dead set on maintaining a 12-plane PPY squadron. 
he had enough personnel to form another crew, but now we need another PBY. Well, the search was on. Ten days later, uh, a replacement aircraft was found on Mattis Island, which is a six-hour flight from the uh, west coast of Nimkini to the other coast. So I picked a, a skeleton crew to go pick up this airplane, and I was picked as a flight engineer. I had a second mate, a radioman, and two junior pilots. Well, they ferried us over to Manus Island, and the minute we got there, all we could hear everybody was saying, this is now an r r island. You can buy all the beer you want. Oh, well, why did they pick a little old island like that? It's hard to get. Somebody made a mistake when they made their uh, r and r island. Anyhow, while we were inspecting our aircraft, the pilots came by and checked off the, what they were responsible for. And then they decided to go out and check the spear situation out. Well, as a three of us there, we figured we'd cool our money and buy some beer to take back to the island where we operated from. Well, if you can imagine two lieutenants and three enlisted people, all we could muster out of the five of us was $29. Folks, we didn't make much money back in 1944. And there's no place down there to spend it. So most of the crews and who were sending the money home. So with this $29, the pilots decided to go, they'd go down and check it out anyway. Well, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a big old cotton Navy truck with three Husky sailors uh, pulled up to my port blister. And they said, we're here to help you load 200 cases of beer. Boy, well, as you can imagine what a spot that put me in. I knew it was going to be tough to start with. I knew I had to start up forward as far as I could. So I picked the biggest compartment in the PPY at that time, and that was it. A nav radio compartment. Well, the PBY has a lot of bilges, but in those bilges is a lot of birds' equipment. It was as a fog So I started up there in a big compartment and I wasn't making a die. Just wasn't any room. But we did have a, a catwalk that went from the back of the pilots clear back to the 50 caliber machine guns. So I started to stack in three cases of beer and I can't walk. And then I could build against it in several cases. So we just started working our way back to the tail of the plane and making it a little progress. And we were, when we got back to the AV crew compartment, we had four canvas bunks, two on each side of the aircraft. So we started tucking these cases of beer into those canvas bunks. Well, I was finally able to tuck in that last case. And then, uh, and then I got to one end row. I wonder if our pilots got in some kind of a crap game and won enough money that uh, they could buy 200 cases of beer. Well, let me tell you how cagey those pilots turned out to be. Uh, the pilots used to make a courtesy call on the, to the staff of the island or base at Chilean. So when they went and heard the hard, hard story of the officers on Manus Island, they had a big car who sipped them hundreds of cases of Milwaukee slit spear right in their lap. But unfortunately, they didn't have the facilities to to move a case of air anywhere. So when our pilots heard that sad story, they said, but sir, 
we're going back to our island tomorrow, and we'd be happy to take beer back to the troops there. And they said, well, that's great. How many cases can you handle? Well, you can just see these two pilots' ears perk up. And uh, both of us, uh, I think, said 200 at the same time. But they had no idea or 200 cases. <laughs> but the next morning when they came down to leave, they were very, very surprised to find out they had to crawl a goddess to the hands and knees across cases of beer to get to the cockpit. <laughs> so I finally got Lieutenant Nelson's attention. I said, sir, I'm really concerned about the weight and balance of this aircraft. I said, do you have any concern? Well, he kind of mumbled and said, well, I'm already prepared to weigh you that and load it when I crawl to the cockpit. But then he poked his finger at me and he said, Sir, he said, yes, but we got something going for it. I said, yes, sir. He said, yeah, we're flying a seaplane. I have all the runway hey, I need on to get airborne. He said, we won't have any problem. I said, well, sir, if you're happy, I guess I must be tickled to death. Let's go. So they put it in the water about 9 o'clock that morning. We finished our pre-flight out there, and then we started on our wrong day call. So now we had 2,500 pounds of beer. Otherwise, we'd have 2,500 pounds of bombs, which would be no problem. There's one other time when I lost a cylinder, one engine, one which the drilling in the ocean out of Australia. That kind of a squadron. I blew the sail now on the way into it. And so on, we made it to get our weight down, we was to release the bombs and kick out everything we didn't need. I dumped a few gallons of gas, and we flew six hours on our. And at that time, back to a vast base in northern California, northern Australia. Largely, you took a liar. Appleth catering a time. Yeah, a PBY takes about 12 football fields. Go ahead, take it um, 12 football fields to get off the water, and uh, that's quite a distance uh, and a really nice runaway, right? That long. Uh, let me just give you a little very quick uh, history back, uh, background here um, and give. Uh, I'm going to finish this more. Uh, yeah, just a sec. So, um, Everything he's telling you is just up through the age of 21, all right? His his history is long, a very long one. And um, and when he, after he finishes the story here, I, I want to um, offer you a, a really interesting glimpse into the rest of it here. So and then we'll do you both. So, get into your beer. Uh, let me finish my, this story. It's, it's really important. <laughs> we had a six-hour flight back to our base at uh, Port Moresby. And uh, about two hours out of the six, six hours flight, I called Lieutenant Taylor on the intercom and I said, sir, we just lost the oil pressure in the starboard engine. I said, I don't see any oil leaks. Said, the oil temp has not changed. I said, I'll keep an eye on it and keep you informed. Well, guess what? Ten minutes later, that engine seized on us. So we had to feather it, secure it, take it off the line. But at that time, we had to increase extra power on the port engine just to stay in the air. So it didn't take us long to know that we had a serious problem on our hands. So we started eliminating our options at that point. And of course, the first option would we going to try to fly the rest of this flight on one engine? And the answer was no. No way with the power we had to draw from that option engine. Well, the next question was, uh, well, what's the next option? 
But folks, five minutes later, we made an emergency one-engine landing with 200 cases of beer in the Bismarck Sea. That's where that old PBY didn't pull apart. You should be sure. Uh, five minutes bobbing around the Bismarck Sea, the pilot and the radio, we got together and sent out a many D request. My uh, second Meg and I were crawling up on top of the wing after breaking down a life raft and securing the, the port blister. And uh, I turned to watch the horizon to see if we was going to spot anybody coming to help us. Well, in actually two hours, and I spotted the ship on the horizon, and it was coming straight for us. It happened to be one of our destroyers, the USS Taylor. I came alongside, but you could see we were pretty miserable. The first thing they did was send over coffee and sandwiches. God, what a blessing I was at that point in that, that operation. The art pilots and their officers got together to see what option we had now. So the and a destroyer officers felt this March Sea was climbing up that they take us in tow and start towing us back to Windia. One of the old pilots radioed Windy Island and asked that the that launch our crash boat to come out and meet us about midnight so they could take over the towing and relieve that destroyer to get back to his convoy. Well, they did arrive about midnight, took over the towing, we had released the destroyer, and so they told us all the rest of the night. At 8.30 the next morning, they were pulling us up on the ramp at Whitney Island. And as soon as they got us up on top and parked us with it, so he said, engine, a skipper of the island stuck his eyes in up at Port Blister, stuck his head in there and real demanding like, said, Sailor, how much beer do you have aboard? I don't really know, sir. Let's pass that by, Lieutenant Nelson. I knew we had two other cases aboard, so I outrode every darn one of them. And uh, this, this question was too demanding for me. I, I was a first class petty officer then, and if I, I had just an air time. And, so I guess with it, when they found out we had this 200 cases of beer aboard, I guess that's all they talked about in all my long hint told it. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyhow, two days later, uh, Lieutenant Taylor came around to our tent to bring us up to date on the beer. Well, a skipper of the station took 40 cases right off the top. <laughs> and helped a lot. And then they started to passing out the beer, one can at a time. And we had CBs on the island, we had a Navy head on our trip. We had 12 plane squadron and courses. Island and a lot of personnel there. So out of those 500 can, 5,000 cans of beer, they started to dish them out one at a time. Had Bunny won the first beer and received the first one. And they got the second one thing. And they got the third one that they wanted. I had instructed the other list of people in the crew. I asked them that they tried to drink a hot beer. <laughs> and I said, don't take any of these rations or pass now. I said, that's a terrible drink. And you just be wasting your time. Now, besides, I don't want those cans of beer in the tent. Which is a good way to stop. <clears throat> Anyhow, that's my, my job. We're getting to replacement aircraft or QBY. Back to our skipper. I was proud that you finally able to do that. In that terrible mission that we went through, 
he did get a replacement aircraft. And that was when I was proud. Beer was an extra plus. <laughs> Slug of water. Yes. It be. Thank you, Cash. Um, Alyssa, if you could come down, please. I understand that uh, Cash has a gift for the uh, museum that he'd like to present. Here you are, sir. This is pretty exciting. <laughs> this is Cash's story. And for those of you who received the letter that we sent uh, a few weeks back, it came from this book. And um, this is the first hard copy of outside of your family. So it's just pretty incredible that this will become part of our archive. So we're really excited to receive this. Um, Cash has agreed to sign some covers um, and we've, uh, we will print some of the book in spiral bound. He's given us permission to do that. So if anyone is interested in that, um, you can connect with us afterwards and Cash is more than happy to sign uh, a cover page for you. And we'll do that um, probably outside, um, right outside the theater. So we want to thank you for coming. This was a very important opportunity. Uh, probably better than smashing champagne on play. Um, we had an opportunity to hear from the person who took care of that play, the flight engineer, um, at the time. So thank you so much for honoring us with this. I got I got the family with five of them. It's very excited when you sent it to me in PDF form. It was just great. And the pictures are just tremendous. Thank you. So, how am, uh, so as uh, Lisa said, we're going to be out. Uh, we're going to adjourn out to a table outside of the uh, um, auditorium, and um, we have the title pages. And uh, if you have any questions with that, I'm sure Cash would um, be happy to answer at that time. But if uh, we could adjourn now, uh, we'd like to give a huge um, thank you to the reaction today. Thank you.